Hello guys, this is a video about AI, Gen AI, Stormgate, and their little teaser that they may be using Gen AI in the game. I would like to talk about what Gen AI is. Now, I'm not an expert on it, but I've done a little bit of research. I would like to talk about whether I like it from the perspective as a consumer, whether I like it from the perspective as a, let's say, neutral observer, whether I want it in my games, and whether there could be any problems of having such mechanics in games. For you see, initially, Steam didn't seem to really allow games on Steam to incorporate AI in their game in a sense of having AI have kind of unpredictable NPC responses that is pulling from a pool of data, which is uh, the underpinning of what Gen AI is. So what is Gen AI? It's actually, as far as I know, kind of an umbrella term for a set of machine learning technologies that pull from an aggregate of data that could be either the entire internet or it could be a curated amount of data as stipulated by the creator, by the programmer. So in the instance, for instance, that a developer says, hey, this AI, uh, this, this, this NPC you're talking to uh, is using Gen AI to have unpredictable responses and it is drawing information from a data set that could either be the entire internet uh, and then any response could come out. They could use one of the popular AI systems like, you know, ChatGPT, however that is built with all the rules inside of it something like that could be built by a game developer uh, you could also instead just feed it a bunch of information that you curate and say only draw your responses from here so when we talk about a uh, gen ai npc that could mean a lot of different things and i want to kind of talk about some of parts of the legality uh, copyright issues potentially but also what is the interest for the developer and or the consumer so th the reason that i'm kind of thinking about this is because there was this video, which I think is very interesting, from GDC, uh, where Stormgate had a small little talk with someone. So let's take a look at it. So here we have Tim Morton. Hi, this is Tim Morton from Frost Giant Studios. From Frost Giant. I'm here today to share with you an experiment that we're doing with generative AI. The idea is that you get a briefing for your campaign mission from a character and that you would then have an opportunity to interact with that character and ask that character questions verbally. The character is able to synthesize answers based on knowledge that we give the character of the world and of the mission that you're about to go on. So as you can see, this is not you know, data pulled from the entire world. It may not pull data from my Facebook page and check who my family is so that when I ask the NPC questions about who is Grubby's brother and who does he work for, then that answer may not actually be forthcoming. Um, before we go on with this, there was another game recently that had a bit of headlines, Vaudeville, that some streamers were playing and it was quite an extensive amount of answers that could come out of the AI. Are you real? Of course, players are going to be trying to you. players are going to be trying to break the game by not just asking about the murder mystery that is being investigated in this game of Valdeville, but they're going to be trying to do all kinds of crazy things because the moment you allow players to talk to an NPC either via voice activation, voice to text, or via uh, text prompts, you're going to get responses that are going to be tying into uh, how the NPC is built by the programmer. And I found that watching these videos of Vaudeville, there was quite a wide array of different responses that could come out. So here, Moist Critical asks, are you real? And she's like, I'm yeah. a real human being. I'm a real human being. The coroner. I have studied the intricacies of the human body, and I understand how the various systems work together to sustain our lives. But despite our biological complexity, we all share a common vulnerability to injury and disease. So I'm not sure if this AI just is pulling from some kind of subset uh, of, of um, data that the vaudeville developers put inside of it because this seems pretty broad like if i made a game and i created this npc character and i said okay this npc character is guilty of a murder but it is supposed to hide the fact that it is guilty and it is going to do so via talking about their hobby of planting you know tulips and wearing clogs 
and living in their windmills and and you should focus on that then it's going to be really a, a weird omission when the player asks them about i don't know escargot and they don't know how to answer it so they're going to need at least the basic understanding of all kinds of different words from the dictionary and know how to deal with that as well Death is a natural part of the human condition, and as a society, we must work to better understand and cope with this inevitability. Wow, that's pretty philosophical. And that also uh, leads us, of course, to the question of what, like, how far do you want the AI to be able to go in conversing with you? If you start hitting on the AI, oh, will you marry me? Will you marry me? Are, are they going to be answering that uh, actually... I am not a real person because I am just an NPC in the game. You have crossed the for you have crossed the boundary one too many times, and you should seek help uh, because I'm not real. And or or are they going to be like, uh, unfortunately, I am already in a relationship, or uh, romantic responses are not part of my answer system. I don't know exactly what they are going to be answering, but of course, players are going to be trying to break AI in all kinds of ways. So to me, the safest feels to really limit the amount of wild things AIs can say so that players never feel offended, uh, never feel like they are going to be angry with the developer because of how an AI rebuffed their advances, about how an AI dissed them, ba basically. And while watching this, I didn't feel like the AI ever really dissed humans. And of course, they are built that way as well to be very safe because that in the end protects the creator and in fact i would imagine that also the way that tim morton is speaking about it here it's data that we feed it right so it's not going to be probably copyright infringing and suddenly start talking about some apple iphone and about how it's better than the samsung galaxy because that data has never been given to it so that the company never becomes liable to some kind of you know weird lawsuit where their game is eschewing one kind of rhetoric over another that could be potentially divisive so it is interesting uh, from a potentially legal perspective i think they are going to be very conservative uh, most developers with how much freedom they give the ai which then uh which then begs the question uh how restrictive is it going to be with their responses and is that then better than normally voice acted work and normal uh, NPCs that have had a script writer that have a set place in the world that have set voice lines and do not interact with the player? That is a question I am not sure about because I haven't seen like the best of what can be made. I, I think there have been really good stories told with NPCs that have their own script and there have been you know worse stories told. But besides all that potential mess, right, all, all, all the different potential answers that could or could not come out of it, I am very fascinated as a consumer that doesn't worry about those things just purely from my side. I'm very fascinated with a NPC that can give everyone different unique experiences with how they answer. We're not sure that this is a feature that we're going to be able to include in the game. There's still all kinds of stuff to figure out ranging from does it work well enough? Does it look good enough? And even is there a way to do this from a business perspective that's fair to the performers who lend their voices to the game? So there's a whole bunch of stuff still to figure out, but it's kind of cool. And so we want to share it with you here. And I think it is cool as well, because uh, especially if you're using like proper people's voices. So here in the vaudeville video, Emotional toll can be just as severe as the physical. It is a very boring, monotone, drab uh, AI voice that is clearly just synthesized and not taken from anyone known. Then you have other YouTube creators that are actually using voice voices from known personalities. I even have a uh, small little, um, let's say, TTS device where you can use people's uh, real voices that have been resynthesized. You can use my voice as well when you do a small donation to this channel. And actually, it is a little bit on the edge. Right now, there's no legislation against it, but I can see that it's probably going to happen relatively soon. So this is safe, but using a known personality's voice, perhaps not so safe. At least now, maybe people are getting away with it, but eventually they won't, as many things go on the internet. So the question is, uh, is there a better way to do it? And Tim Morton seems to kind of suggest 
that there is a better way to do it. If the creators actually sign off on it, then it's actually not that bad. So say for instance, normally a voice actor does a job for a game, they have X how many hours of work on a game and they get paid a set amount for their hours. Uh, so instead they would only give uh, their voice, which would then be synthesized by AI potentially, right? If that's how they do it. And then the rights to their voice would still be sold and, and contracted and negotiated with an amount that both would be happy with, with stipulations of what they could be at most be said to say, how much hours of their synthesized voice would be allowed to be used. And if both parties are happy with it, then I think that's a lot better way than just ripping off someone's voice and then using it commercially uh, in perpetuity. Congratulations on the successful mission. Your team has been knocking it out of the park so far, but this next assignment's gonna be a lot trickier. You'll be tracking down ancient artifacts that could alter the course of the war. Be on the lookout though, cause Infernals are everywhere. Oh, I've heard about the Infernals. Who are they? Infernals are hostile aliens who've attacked humanity. Studying them is crucial for our defense. Let's go back to the artifacts you mentioned earlier. Where might I find one? Artifacts are worldwide, in ancient sites or unearthed in digs, revealing our universe's mysteries. I did find something that I think might be an artifact. That's fascinating. What type of artifact did you discover? It's an old alien looking sword with some kind of inscriptions on the hilt. An ancient sword with inscriptions? That's an intriguing find. Anyway. Do you need assistance in deciphering the writings? Yes, I do, but not yet. I'm playing with some friends, and we're about to start another mission. Thanks for your help. Goodbye, and best of luck on your next mission. If you need to decode the inscriptions later, feel free to reach out. So that's uh, pretty interesting. I think there's a lot uh, to unpack there. Of course, the voice could be better, because right now it's kind of uncanny, and this is just a demo then I also think there's going to be a very small percentage of players that actually plays by the book. I think most people will be actually focusing on trying to break the routine of the AI. They're not going to say that they found a sword uh, that has some runes on it. They're going to, they're going to, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to come up with everything that people are going to say, but uh, people are going to try to stay in that and just have that become the game, right? Just to talk with AI. And I know it's this because I would want to do that too, right? So uh, I don't know how they're going to parry all those potential, um, let's say, questions that are irrelevant to the, to the game. But this could be interesting. Uh, this could be interesting. I am curious to see what it could be. Though at the moment, of course, I don't think this particular demo was a good substitute for real charming voice work and storytelling uh, and so on. And someone in chat asks, would you uh, accept $1,000 for 100% ownership of your voice forever? No, of course not. And I don't think contracts with that Stormgate would levy with uh, actors would have those kind of stipulations. Of course, if they're actually going about it the right way and contract for contracting for it, it would be more likely to be something like you do a five minute voice, um, you read out a script for five minutes, your voice gets used for that, uh, in that script, you laugh, you shout, you cry so that the, you know, the program can copy your voice in the best way possible. And then there would be something like your voice is allowed to be used up to 10 hours of voice work. And then you get a sum for that 12K, whatever, right? No more than 10 hours. The advantage for you is it costs you less time. You just did the five minutes, but you're selling the rights, all right? And not the labor. And the advantage for them is it's cheaper and then they can use the voice that way. But it could lead to a disturbing trend where, you know, voice actors are being sh not, yeah, maybe shorted, let's say outcompeted by such kind of contracts and that therefore the market rate for voice actors will drop a lot. And the way that that would affect customers is that of course, we're gonna have poorer quality voice acting. And it also brings across another point. It's not just sometimes how reliable the delivery of an actor is but it's also about does it matter to the customer whether it's real or not 
does it matter whether it's real or not? For instance, if an AI was able to do the exact same thing that I do, um, you know, be me, have my imagery, play my games, talk about things that I would talk about, uh, but I told you that it's AI, would that matter to you? Just knowing that it's not real, even if it acted in the exact same way, should it matter? Would it matter? And I think as a viewer, to me, it would matter. And what if I told you that right now, I'm still real? So that's, uh, that's the part of uh, the AI NPC reading. I have a lot of questions about it. I have some opinions on it. I am basically in conclusion of this, I am very interested in seeing how fun it would be to talk to and to play with this kind of mechanic. But I'm not convinced yet that most games that we're going to be seeing trying this are going to create a more compelling long-term experience than what just a proper good story would be. I'm open to it and I hope that actors would be, you know, treated fairly uh, when it comes to leveraging these kind of rights. And then the second part of it is Stormgate just revealed their map editor, their level editor, a couple of days ago. So let's take a look at that. There's a small little video here where Frost Giant shows off their map editor. Now, of course, it may not be a surprise to many of you that I haven't been playing a whole lot of Stormgate uh, yet. I think the game is pretty fun. And this video isn't about its audio or visuals, though I'm not extremely excited about those at this time yet. Uh, the visual of the game uh, and the audio landscape. This isn't about that. Um, just talking about the gameplay and the map editor here. Gameplay has been pretty fun. I haven't felt extremely compelled to uh, spam a lot more games, but I'm continuing to have a very curious eye on the game when I see uh, when I'm going to be seeing, you know, the third faction coming out and also, of course, the tier three technology tree for the two existing factions. Hi, I'm Aaron Larson, the lead campaign designer here at Frost Giant. And today I'm going to be giving you an early look at the Stormgate in-game editor that we are using to develop the game. Here I am playing Stormgate on Titan's Causeway, and uh, I want to make some changes to this map. To do that, I simply push F12. The game will take a quick moment. And I do wonder how he's going to press F12, like when you're playing single player or <laughs> when you're playing multiplayer. Like, I don't like how this game is going. I'm going to press F12 and I'm going to throw up a wall between my opponent and me so he can't attack me anymore. Like, and here he says he just pressed F12, but of course I don't know within the context of, you know, what you are allowed to be doing potentially during that. Put me right in the editor. So first up, we're going to be starting in the terrain tab and using the click tool. Um, what I want to try to do here is see if I can make this area a little bit safer for the player to take. So of course we don't want this looks pretty easy to do. Uh, it's kind of like uh, Photoshop made easy. You just go over it with a circle and you raise all the terrain. So you, you take the cliff tool and you use a round or a diamond or, or a square and then you can raise the terrain. That's as far as I know, that's some of the simplest I've ever seen a map editor work. I want to make it too easy. So let's add a ramp in here as well. And um, one thing you'll notice here is I've got symmetry turned on. So I can just go back to the other side and that's already done for me. That's pretty cool, right? It does so on the same side for complete symmetry uh, recreation. I don't know. I don't think that Warcraft 3 map editor has that. There are a lot seamless. of different options for symmetry, including uh, rotational two-way, rotational four-way, symmetry. The symmetry tool doesn't just work with cliffs. Um, this can also work with just about every other tool we have here. So we'll start with a That's little bit of, of the sandy texture and put a little bit of dirt around it as well. So as I'm painting in, you'll notice that this is actually taking information from the height map that the texture uses. This way we can get natural looking transitions without too much effort. In order to... It's not that natural looking, but <laughs> I get the point. ...really speed up our development time, we really wanted to use paintbrushes for as many things as possible. Things like uh, height manipulation, we can paint collision and even paint water. In addition to that, we also have tools for painting things like trees down. We can create forests like really quickly, or even better, 
we can take the uh, light forest and replace some of these um, quite easily just using these paintbrush tools. And when it comes to decorating, we have a whole number of options for decorating maps. And one of the things that we did to help us find things quickly is create tags. So I can type in forest and that will give me um, Rock not just stuff. things that are named forest, but things that go in our forest tile set. So we can add all number of things that belong in the um, forest tile set. Oh, and butterflies for the flowers, that'll be nice. Now let's go ahead and add some more functionality to this map. I have got this idea. I want to create a convoy that moves across the map and give the players a chance to intercept that convoy for a chance at winning some extra resources. In order to get this convoy working, we're going to use triggers. We use triggers um, to build our content. Um, this is very similar to how it worked in Warcraft 3 and Starcraft 2, and we use this in order to speed up the map making process. But it also is a lot safer. You can just start plugging things in and it'll start working. Now I've got a couple triggers set up here and I'm going to walk through them. First, we have a convoy spawn trigger. And we can use the events to tell the mission when these events should happen. So starting with map initialization, as well as every 120 seconds of mission time, where this whole event is going to fire. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a chicken. We're going to assign it to a very Still kind of weird to use uh, chickens as the placeholder. Like it's kind of immersion breaking, but I, I know they're just placeholders for now. Variable, and then we're going to tell that chicken to move across the map to the other side. The other thing we're going to do is we have a convoy dies trigger. We can pass that variable if that we dies. set up earlier into this event. And when that chicken dies, we can uh, create a reward. All right, here we are in game. And look at that. Our little chicken is moving across the map. The convoy chicken. Let's go ahead and test out to see if um, it'll drop some rewards. It did. Hooray. Everything's working great. It did. <laughs> Hooray. Everything's working great. I mean, <laughs> the reward and the kill worked. All right, so going into the data tab, we have a lot of places where we can put data. Different game effects. Hey, they blended this out. Is it because this is showing something about the third faction? It's like buffs or buttons for abilities or various um, game effects like creating unit or doing damage or healing, um, so on and so forth. Not only can you use any number of existing effects that we've already created, but you can also quickly and effectively create Make something completely custom. Mm. So let's go ahead and create a new unit with some new abilities. Let's give it the Weaver's Lash ability. And we also want to give it a button on the command card. And let's it's, go ahead and make some updates. Well, what do you think is going to be the third faction? You don't want angels? I think it's going to be angels, to be honest. Let's be real. They have humans. They have demons. The third is going to be angels. Come on. What else is it going to be? Dates to the last. Robots. Demons, robots, and humans. But the Vanguard already looks very robotic, right? A lot of their units. I mean, you've got a couple. You've got the Lancer, and then you've got the, the Gunner, whatever he's called. Uh, but they have a whole bunch of bots. Insect race is somewhat... Ex exemplified via the uh, infernal already it could be aliens yeah it could be aliens blobs it could be oozes right one giant ooze becomes two smaller oozes becomes four oozes and they slime you and that's gonna like reduce the amount of things you can do lash ability as well let's turn on autocast it'd be so funny if it was canadians just straight up south park canadians It'd be so good. People be like, wait, is this placeholder too? Nope. Ikes, Ikes are your worker unit. And we'll set the cooldown to one. All right, that should do it. Let's test it out. All right, so our boss spawned here. <laughs> Kick the baby, suck a worker. Let's give him some bad guys to shoot. There you have it. That's the start of a new ability. There's a lot of ways to take it from here to really customize and That's make cool. it exactly the way you want. Okay, now I'm pretty curious what kind of maps people could come up with, right? But even with some of the more archaic map editors in Warcraft 3 and Starcraft 2, Starcraft 1, some amazing maps have been made. And Dota 2, I think 
in the strategy genre, the best map editors are SC1, Warcraft 3, SC2, Dota 2. All right. Those are just in crazy, like crazy map editors. And I think Age of Empires 2 also has fantastic map editing with lots of cool different uh, maps. So no matter how archaic or not, those are all already working. I think the key is going to be not how good this editor is, though it is very good when it is good and it looks pretty good to me. It's how many people are going to be playing the game. Want it to. Thanks for watching this early demonstration of the Stormgate in-game cool. editor. These are work in progress tools that we're still building functionality for, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to make this tool as user friendly and fast as possible. We can't wait to release the Stormgate in game editor to the public and see what the world will create with these tools. All right, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, he's going to be trying to make it more uh, user friendly. And then the gen the gen AI part. Let's see how that's gonna go. I think this was I think the gen AI part was just um, uh, we're thinking about this. And I think personally, my guess, if we're gonna make a guess and a, and, and a bet, right? I think it's not gonna happen. I think they'll just have voice acted work. But I do hope that I will be playing some games soon where it is included, so I can get more experience using it and seeing if it's gonna be fun and seeing if we can get some interesting interactions that are unique to the player. And I think if it's done in the right way, it could be a really cool tool. Lastly, of course, about the Gen AI part, uh, there is a legal landscape and a copyright issue. To be honest, I find it incredibly difficult to judge whether Gen AI is copyright infringing because it's the same with all those, you know, those AI generation tools, Midjourney and Wally, -E, etc. They're looking at all these existing imageries and, and paintings and pictures that have been made by original artists. They're looking at them and then they're resynthesizing pixels and styles from those to make new imagery. Now, as a consumer that doesn't give a damn about the legal landscape, let's say if I'm like, I'm caricaturing a consumer that is 100% selfish and doesn't worry about any of it. I love it. I think there's a lot of cool artwork coming out of it that I just love to look at. And if I'm completely, you know, selfish, then I don't care about any of that because I'm not the one doing it. I'm just seeing it. And I think that looks really, really cool. But if you're an artist and the bot is like scanning your work and then resynthesizing your style, that doesn't feel very good. And I th already think it's kind of a difficult topic of the law because uh, humans also infringe each other's work, right? They plagiarize each other's work. And it can be really hard to prove sometimes because we're all inspired by things that we've seen before. And you have to prove a deliberate intent to stay close to the original work, to really recreate ideas intentionally with malicious stealing intent. Uh, where you're where you're doing too close of a copy of someone's work and in much of the work that you may see coming out of an ai generation uh, artwork machine it's hard to prove where they really got it from right and with humans sometimes it's also hard to prove that part so i don't know how they're going to eventually make this uh, you know work well for the law and if there's anything we've learned from how the government and politicians deal with rapid advances on technology, I think it's going to be a, a wild west for a long time to come. Just look at the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. That is a dinosaur of a time past that doesn't work at all well. And YouTube is like, you know, they're defending themselves from liability by any any youtube creator that is copyright striking someone else they just immediately punish and then check if there's actually a problem in a longer investigative process that could take a week it's always the claimer of the copyright act first that gets given the right because youtube doesn't want to have any risk or any liability with that that is a really old act and it needs a revamp but politicians aren't that tech savvy on average so yeah, I don't know whether they're going to come out with good legal landscape uh, for this. So uh, it seems to me risky for big games, AAA companies or AA, to really take that plunge and start testing Gen AI that is trained on data that is publicly available. So instead, what I expect when Gen AI does get put into big games, they're going to have a much smaller subset of data that really doesn't make the end result as interesting as it could be because 
of the limitations being put on them and then i think it's going to be scarcely better than the real thing of just a script writer and voice acting but we'll see how it goes i'm still curious to try it out see you next video